Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Netai Gor Hari Bo Hari Bo Hari Bo Netai Gor Hari Bo
Jai Jai Prabhu Pad Prabhu Pad Prabhu Pad Jai Sri La Prabhu Pad. Gaur Premanande Hari Bo. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pastaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pitarine Nervisesha Sunyavadi Paschachati Satarine Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So we're recounting the travels of Narada Muni as he searches for the person who has received the greatest mercy from the Lord. And we heard how Narada Muni, he had come to the heavenly planets, he met Indra, he met Indra, and then he, from Indra, he went to see Lord Brahma. And from Lord Brahma, he heard about the heavenly planets, but he didn't go there. Lord Brahma said there was another devotee. Oh, he said, go to see Lord Shiva, right? Went to see Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva then told him about the heavenly planet. Was not, did Lord Shiva tell about the heavenly planets? Lord Brahma was telling about the heavenly planets, right? Lord Shiva told him about Prahlad, that there's a great devotee called Prahlad. He's such a great devotee, wherever he is, it's the spiritual world. He's so transcendentally situated that he doesn't see any difference between the material and spiritual world. Just like Srila Prabhupada also he would be in New York, but he said, I am not in New York. He said, I'm always in Vrindavan. I'm always thinking of Krishna. So like that, the transcendentalists, those who have actually transcended the bodily platform and who are situated in Krishna consciousness, then they can feel the presence, they can feel the spiritual world. There is no material world. For them, this is the spiritual world. They don't see any difference. So, uh, Lord Shiva sent Narada Muni to go and see Prahlad and Narada Muni, when he's meeting with Prahlad, he's glorifying Prahlad and he's explained about some of the different events which happened in Prahlad's life. How when he was a young boy, he was preaching Krishna consciousness to the children who were born in the family of demons and how he convinced them about Krishna consciousness. And then Narada recounts a famous pastime which took place when Prahlad was going to Naimasharanya. So this event, this pastime is described in different scriptures, several scriptures, and it tells about how Prahlad Maharaj was going to Naimasharanya. He wanted to go there to worship Lord Narayan, particularly the Lord in the form of Pitavasa. 
Pitabas means one who's in the yellow dress. So Prahlad, when he was journeying to Naimasharanya, at one point on his path, he came across a person who was dressed like a renunciate. In other words, he had saffron cloth on and different uh, other features. Either he had a shaved head or matted lock, we're not told too much, but he had the appearance of a person in the renounced order of life. But at the same time, he was carrying with him a bow and arrows. So when Prahlad Maharaj saw that this person is dressed like a holy man, but he is carrying a bow and arrows, he thought this person is just a nonsense. You know, it's such a contradiction. And if this, this man is just going to disturb the minds of people by his appearance like this, he's not properly representing the religious principles. A holy man, a sadhu, should not be carrying weapons. You know, either you're a kshatriya or you're a brahman. There's a difference, you know. You can't be a kshatriya and at the same time a brahman. So Prahlad Maharaj decided he would have to teach this person a lesson. So he fought with him. And they fought for many days. And Prahlad, Prahlad Maharaj vowed that I'm going to defeat this person. I'm going to make him, uh, I'm going to make him repent for his behavior, for his misrepresenting the principles of religion. But although Prahlad fought day after day, Prahlad was never able to defeat the person. But then it happened that one morning before they began fighting, every morning Prahlad Maharaj would worship his own personal deity. He was carrying with him a deity of Pitabhas, a deity, deity of the Lord with the yellow dress. And when he offered the garland to the deity, then he looked around and he saw that the person who he was going to fight, who had been fighting with every day, he saw that person was standing there and he was wearing the same garland which he had offered to the deity. So Prahlad Maharaj understood that this person he'd been fighting was actually Pitabhas. This was actually Lord Narayan who'd come. And Prahlad Maharaj went to the went to the, the Lord and surrendered himself and apologized not rec for not recognizing him. But then he also said to the Lord, he said that, you know, I made a vow that I would defeat you. And I must, as a Kshatriya, I should keep my vow. What should I do? And the Lord said to Prahlad Maharaj, he said, I am always conquered by you. So this was the famous reply of the Lord to Prahlad Maharaj, that he said, I am always conquered by you. So then, uh, Narada Muni continues, he said, not only did you conquer the Lord, but your grandson, Bali Maharaj, he also conquered the Lord. He was also a great devotee. He also conquered him. And that's why the Lord is staying with him at Sutala Loka. The Lord is there as his doorman because Bali conquered him. Bali conquered the Lord by his devotion and surrender, that he surrendered everything to Lord Bamana Dev. To surrender everything. It's one of the very, very difficult 
types of devotional service to become the friend of the Lord and to surrender everything. These two out of the nine kinds of devotional service, these two are the, the most difficult to become a friend of the Lord, like Arjuna or like the cowherd boys are friends. That is requires very deep love and mood of devotion. And similarly, to surrender everything requires tremendous detachment and sacrifice. And we see that the greatest sacrifice in the behavior of Bali Maharaj, that when Lord Vamanadev came and arrested Bali Maharaj because he because he didn't keep his promise. He had promised him three steps of land, but Lord Vamana Dev had covered the whole universe with two steps. So Lord Vamana Dev arrested Bali Maharaj and said, you did not keep your promise. But of course, Bali Maharaj kept his composure and told the Lord that you can take the third step on my head because my body is not part of the, the three worlds. So you can take that third step on my head. And the Lord did. So in, in this way, Bali Maharaj surrendered everything. He had conquered the heavenly planets. He'd conquered all the demigods. And he'd, he himself had become the king of heaven. So he was enjoying unlimited opulence, but let Lord Vamanadev came and took everything away. So it's, it's very difficult to have everything taken away from you. Sometimes we see people when they lose their fortune, it's very painful for them. There was one businessman in Hong Kong. He was a, a toy exporter. He was manufacturing children's toys and sending them to America. So he had a very big shipment one time. And uh, when the shipment got in port in the USA, then the health authorities came and inspected it. And they declared that these toys have been painted with a paint which is toxic. This paint is poisonous and it's going to cause a lot of serious illness and may even kill, take the lives of people away. So they said all these toys, they all have to be thrown away. None of them can come in the country. So this man, he'd invested all of his fortune in this shipment, you know? And when he got the news that he'd lost all his money, he could not tolerate it, he committed suicide because the thought of living without his business, without his money was unbearable to him. But here you see Bali Maharaj, Bali Maharaj lost everything. The Lord took everything away and sent him back to Sutala Loka in the lower regions of the universe. And Bali Maharaj is quite composed. He's persevering. He's telling the Lord, take the third step on my head. So such a great devotee, ready to sacrifice everything for the Lord. All right, so uh, then we have uh, Narada Muni, Further glorifying uh, Lord Nasringadev. Uh, he says to him, uh, there's a, uh, Narada Muni said, the ocean, the ocean of ecstasies in devotion. The Lord Hari began to dance. This intimate servant of the Lord shouted, 
conquered by us. Conquered by us. So this way Narada is glorifying uh, Prahlad. But then uh, Narada Muni, he talks about how the Lord was also conquered by Bali. And then, uh, then Narada Muni tells Prahlad Maharaj, he said, from now on, I'm going to stay here permanently with you. By your mercy, I shall certainly be able to conquer the curses I have received from Daksha and others. So Narada Muni had been cursed, not once, <laughs> but at, at least a couple of times he got cursed. The first curse was by Daksha. Of course, Daksha is one of the Prajapatis and he wanted to procreate the universe. Daksha means expert. He was very expert in conceiving children. He didn't just conceive one or two children. He had 10,000 sons. So he had produced 10,000 sons in the womb of one of his wives. And the 10,000 sons were meant to uh, help him to procreate, the, fill up the universe, to produce progeny, right? We were talking yesterday about the three debts, remember? One debt to the demigods, one debt to the sages, and one debt to the parents. And you repay the debt to the parents when you get married and produce children, right? The, your mother and father, they want to see you married, but they, does, they don't just want to see you married. They want to see you with a child, right? You have to have a child. So, so Daksha, he had 10,000 sons and he wants them also to get married and have children in this way, fill up the universe. But what happened was, the system is in the Vedic culture, before marriage, you first of all go and do some austerity, do some tapasya to purify yourself, to prepare for family life. This is the Vedic culture. You know, today people don't understand these things, you know. You tell people, you're getting married, probably before you get married, you first of all do some tapasya. And they say, what? You gotta be joking. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they don't take it seriously. They don't understand the importance. You know, entering into family life is a responsibility, a responsibility that you're going to produce children and take care of a wife, it's a responsibility. You have to prepare yourself for that. And the proper preparation for that is to do some austerity, to do some tapasya. Uh, one country which I visit is Thailand. Thailand, not, not far away from India. Yeah, and a lot of Vedic culture is there. You know, even the, the Previously, before Bangkok, the capital of Thailand used to be a place called Ayutthaya, from the name Ayodhya, and Thai is Ayutthaya. And all the kings in Thailand, they're all called Rama. And you'll see the different roads there. There's Rama 9 and Rama 3 and Rama 5, all named after different kings. So they have a lot of Vedic culture. Prabhupada said, However, he said, Thailand is a place of Vedic culture for sense gratification. <laughs> so unfortunately, Thailand has that kind of reputation that people go there for sense gratification. Now it's a Buddhist country, became Buddhist, but still the, a lot of the Vedic culture is there. So it happens that Young men, before they get married, 
they first of all become a monk. They first of all go and live in the ashram, go and live in the monastery and become a monk. And they go there, it will be a fixed time. They'll go and live in the monastery for a month or three months or maybe even longer. But the idea is they do, they'll become a monk. They'll shave their head, they'll put on the monk's dress and they'll go with the other monks. The monks there, they live by begging. They'll go out every morning to beg their food. And so they will do that for, you know, whatever period. And they have a ceremony when they come in and they become a monk and they get ordained. And when they finish and go back, they have another ceremony. They go out, they do a ceremony. So I thought it's actually quite nice how they do that. And they recognize the need for purification. Because they know, you know, after I've been a monk, I've lived in the temple and I've done my, then they go back and they get married. And the marriage is arranged, right? And so, very nice culture. So, similarly, Daksha had 10,000 sons. He told them, first of all, go and do some austerities for some, for some time. And then when you come back, we'll get you married. So Daksha's sons all went, and what happened was they went to this holy place, and Narada Muni happened to come by, and he saw these young men, 10,000 young men, all sitting, meditating, and he thought, oh, so many nice young men. He thought, why they need to get married? He thought, you know, better they should be. They should remain. That's they're doing. They're all. They were. They were there in the holy place, and they were in meditation. They were in trance. Their minds were peaceful. They were not disturbed. They were not agitated. They were free of passion and ignorance. So Narada Muni understood. You know that uh, he preached to them, and he. he there's a nice analogy. It's all described in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Probably men, you've read it. It's in the, I think it's the third canto, fourth canto, fourth canto. It's so very nice how Narada Muni delivered these 10,000 sons. So they didn't go home because they heard Narada Muni preaching and they got inspired and they were convinced by Narada Muni no need to go home. We should go to the real home. The real home is the spiritual world. They thought we want to go back to that home, back to our real home, not to just the father of our body, but to our eternal spiritual father. And so they didn't go back to Daksha. So Daksha got news, 10,000 sons. None of them are coming back. Uh, Daksha was really upset. Anyway, Daksha had some more children. And this time, 1,000 sons. And this 1,000 sons, again, they grow up. And then he tells them, you go and get purified. When you come back, we will have your marriage. So the 1,000 sons, they go off again to a holy place. And again, Narada Muni happens to see them. And Narada Muni meets them and he tells them, you know, he said, your brother, she said, they've already gone to this other place. You know, they didn't go home. You know, they were your brothers, your elder brothers. They didn't go back. They've gone on to the higher place, to the higher abode. You should follow them. You should follow your brothers. So the 1,000 sons, they heard Narada Muni, and they thought, very good. Why go home? And they also didn't go home. So when Daksha got the news, 1,000 sons also not coming home. Oh, no. Daksha was really angry. And got very angry at Narada Muni. I said, this is your fault. You're a rascal. And Narada Muni actually came to see Daksha. 
because Narada Muni was thinking, maybe I can make Daksha also a devotee. <laughs> he thought his sons are such nice devotees, maybe I can make the father also a devotee. But Daksha, <laughs> he was quite angry at Narada Muni and he cursed Narada Muni, he cursed him, I curse you that you will not be able to stay in one place for more than a, a short time. You will only be able to stay a short time in one place. So Narada Muni was, I thought, well, okay, that's, that's actually a, a blessing, right? Sometimes, sometimes is what seems like a curse to the materialist is a blessing to the devotee. Because when Narada Muni had been cursed that he couldn't stay for a long time in one place, he thought, good, I won't get attached. Because you stay too long in one place, you get comfortable, you know, you have your place, you have everything arranged for your comforts. You, you, get, can, you, get, you get attached to being in that one place. Prabhupada was on a morning walk one time. Did you hear that pastime? Prabhupada was on the morning walk and they were walking and there was this, on the pathway, they could see all the birds stool and it was under a tree and Prabhupada stopped and he pointed to it and he said to the devotees, he said, what does this tell you? What does this represent? What is this? And one devotee said, Prabhupada is bird stool. Prabhupada said, I know it's bird stool, you <laughs> stupid. <laughs> you know, of course, I know what it is, but what does it tell you? And the devotees couldn't think, they said, what does it tell you? And Prabhupada said, that even the birds are attached to passing stool in one place every day. Because they come the same place, the same tree, and they pass stool there every day. So Prabhupada said like that, even the birds, they get attached to passing stool in one place every day. So materialistic people also, they get very attached to being in one place and they make all facilities, all their arrangements. It's very difficult. You know, when they have to go to my, when they go to a holy place, it's quite difficult for them, you know, it's quite austere because they're away. Oh, I don't have this. Oh, I don't have that. Oh, you know, it, it's a challenge for them. And if they go out on parikrama, if you do the Brajamandal parikrama or like that, then, you know, Brajam, Brajamandal parikrama, one month walk. Oh, you know, it's very difficult for them to be away from the home and their their comfortable situation. So, Daksha cursed Narada Muni, you will not be able to stay very long in any one place. And generally, it's a rule like that, that a sannyasi, when he is traveling, he will not stay more than three days in one place. When Prabhupada was in Kenya, in Kenya, uh, there's Oh, quite, at that time, there was quite a lot of Gujarati people living there in Kenya. And uh, Prabhupada, at that time, we didn't have a nice big temple for Prabhupada to stay in. So they arranged for Prabhupada to stay in the homes of different Indian people. And Prabhupada would only stay three days in each house. He'd stay for three days in one house and then leave. He said, after three days, then it becomes a burden. So Prabhupada would only stay three days and then he'd move to another house. And in this way, he followed the Vedic culture. So uh, Narada Muni got this curse from Daksha that uh, he couldn't stay. And then he got another curse. And uh, there was another curse. Who was it? It was uh, this, uh, this, uh, Forget her name. Oh yeah, the daughter of time. The daughter of time, she could. The daughter of time is old age. <laughs> right? <laughs> so that's mentioned also. That's in the fourth canto also. It's in relation to the Paranjan analogy. 
the daughter of time, old age. She wanted to marry Narada Muni. <laughs> you know, would you like to marry a wife <laughs> who represents old age? <laughs> you know, you don't want a, a wife who's old age, who rep the manifestation of old age. You know, people want a young wife, you know, you don't want an old wife. Uh, a, but this old age, she became attracted to Narada Muni and she wanted Narada Muni to marry her. Narada Muni said, no, no, I'm a brahmachari, I'm not going to marry. So she cursed him, that you will not stay in any one place. So Narada Muni is saying to Prahlad Maharaj, he said, I'm going to stay with you and by your grace, I'll be able to overcome these curses which I have received. So <laughs> this, is, uh, this is the hope of Narada Muni that he can stay with Prahlad. However, we'll hear what Prahlad has to say. First of all, Prahlad is very upset to hear himself glorified. He feels embarrassed and he bows down before Narada Muni. He has to be very careful how he speaks to Narada Muni because they have a relationship, remember. Remember Prahlad and Narada Muni? Narada is, he's the guru of Prahlad. Yeah, Narada is the guru of Prahlad. So you can't go yelling and shouting at your guru. You have to be humble before the guru, right? Tadvidi prani patena. So Prahlad, Usually, if people would praise him and glorify him, he would get angry. But with Narada Muni, because Narada Muni is his, his Shiksha guru, so Narada Muni, Prahlad just becomes embarrassed and he bows his head and he speaks softly because he's, he's showing respect to his guru. And he's going to tell, he's going to tell that what you're saying about me actually is not really true. One of the things which uh, Narada was saying about Prahlad was that you, you made the demons into devotees. You made the demons, you made all these asuras into devotees. But who were these demons? These demons were the, the children of the demons, actually. Prahlad was preaching to the school in the school, in the Gurukula. When he was in the Gurukula with Sanda and Namarka, who were the teachers, Sanda and Namarka are the two sons of Sukracharya, and they were given the job to teach the children of the demons. But Prahlad came there and he taught them about devotional service. So he said, yeah, he said, I made some demons into devotees, but who were these demons? They were children and actually, a saintly person should never preach to children. It's not, so, it's not really allowed that a saintly person will come and preach to children and influence the minds of young children. You, sh you, you, sh you have to wait till people grow up a little bit until they have some maturity and they can make the proper discrimination in their minds. If a saintly person comes along and starts preaching to little children and influencing their minds, the parents will get all upset. Why are you influencing my children like this? You know, why you, you want my children to be like you, is it? You want to take my children away from me? And you know how it is. Sometimes the children come and then they go home and they say, mommy, we're not supposed to drink tea. We're not supposed to take coffee. Mommy, watching television is Maya. And, you know, they go home and they start preaching to their parents. Their parents get all angry. No, don't go to the temple anymore. You just stay here. <laughs> I don't want you going to the temple. They teach you all this stuff. And then you come home and you start trying to tell me that we can't do this. We can't do that. So Prahlad is saying, you know, I only preached. I was only with some friends in the class. I, you know. They were just children who I preached to. I didn't preach to, and, and I didn't really preach to any real adults. 
uh, young children generally they just can't understand devotional service. And then Prahlad Maharaj says, when one gets instruction from great souls, these instructions, they awaken us to a higher understanding. And then we engage in devotional service. So it's not the sign, it's not necessarily a sign of greatness that an ordinary person like me, Prahlad Maharaj is saying, it's not a sign of greatness that a person like me, that I can go through, that I could tolerate so many disturbances. You know, my father trying to kill me and all that. I, I, you know, that's not a sign of my greatness that I tolerated all that. It was just, you know, I got spiritual instruction. So that's how I was able to tolerate. It's not a sign of greatness that I could enlighten children or behave like, you say, I behave like a saintly person and show compassion on suffering souls and refuse the boon of liberation. Prahlad Maharaj is saying, I may have done all of these things, but that's not a sign of my greatness. Don't think I'm a great soul. No. Prahlad Maharaj is saying, you know, I just got instruction. I got instruction from a great soul. <laughs> he got instruction from Narada Muni. He's telling Narada Muni, you, you know, you instructed me. You gave me all this. So the, the result of getting instruction from a saintly person is that you realize the futility of material sense gratification and you lose your interest in economic development, these things. What is considered the four goals in material life, you know, dharma, artha, kama, moksha, they become insignificant when we understand the power of devotional service. So it's hearing about the glories of devotional service, which allows us to be detached from everything in the world. And Prahlad Maharaj said, the real mercy of Krishna, you can find that only in somebody who's a truly worthy servant of Krishna. You have to see somebody who is actually doing some service for Krishna. This is Prahlad's argument. He said, that actually, that I, that, you know, I, I, don't, I don't do anything. Sometimes, he says, sometimes when my mind is agitated, then sometimes I'm able to remember Krishna and I'll fix my mind on Krishna when I have some troubles in the mind. He said, but I never do anything. I never do any service for Krishna. You want to find somebody who's really worthy of the mercy of Krishna, they do service for Krishna. And Prahlad talks about Hanuman, that Hanuman, He's really a great devotee. He does service for the Lord. I don't do anything for the Lord. I just sometimes I'm able to remember him when my mind's in anxiety. But that doesn't make me a great devotee. Don't think I'm a great devotee just because of that. Whatever I've done, whatever, whatever compassion I feel for the fallen souls, I don't go out and deliver them. I may feel, I may talk about being compassionate, 
but I, I don't go out and deliver them. So then uh, he says, I, I have never performed any real service for the Lord. I have only remembered the Lord sometimes when my mind was troubled. You praised me because the Lord caressed me and showed other signs of affection. But such, cons but some people consider that affection which was shown by the Lord to me, they think that was a show of Maya or just a show, a, a, just a show of his pastimes. So Lord Nishringadev actually felt so much affection towards Prahlad Maharaj. Now in the previous avatars before Lord Nishringadev, before Lord Nishringadev, you have Lord Baraha. And before Lord Baraha, you had Matsya and Kurma and uh, well, Matsya, Kurma, Varaha, Lord Nishinga and so forth. So you can see in those other avatars, there was no rasa. They were just simply the Lord in his fish incarnation and then in his turtle incarnation and then Varaha. But then when Lord Nishingadev comes, somehow Prahlad becomes like his little child. And Prahlad, you know, because Lord Nishingadev was very angry. And then Lord Brahma told Prahlad, you go and go and try to calm Lord Nishingadev. Prahlad came and offered his obeisances. Lord Nishingadev picked up Prahlad and embraced him. And he began to lick him just like a lion will lick the body of his cubs. The, the lion, the lioness, they'll lick the body of their cubs. So Lord Nishingadev was licking the body of Prahlad like his child. And then he puts Prahlad also on his lap. And he developed that mood, Lord Nishingadev developed that mood of Vatsalyaras. And he started to feel that, oh, this is something new. This is something enjoyable. You know, being a father, and having a child, it is, you know, it's something people enjoy. They take some pleasure in it. You have a child, and you know, and your child will be naturally, there'll be some affection there. So Lord Nishingadev awakened that mood of Vatsalya Ras because of Prahlad Maharaj. And you see, after Lord Nishingadev, then you see you see more rasa there also. You see, for example, Lord Ramachandra, uh, and he, he's married, and he has his father, and everything like this. Lord Vamanadev, he's also the son of Kashyapa and Aditi. And then after Lord Rama, and then you have uh, oh, Parasurama, of course, he's in there. He also. Yes, his father, Parasurama's father, Jamadagni, is it? Hmm? So, uh, like that, you can see the, the rasa developing more, feeling more rasa, and then ultimately come to Krishna, and Krishna is uh, complete. He's rasa purna, the, all the rasas are there with Krishna. With Lord Ramachandra, the rasas are still limited to Dashya and Sakya a little bit. Lord Ramachandra is the king. So the mood of Vaikuntha is more Dashya Ras, predominantly Dashya Ras, with a little bit of Sakya Ras. But Lord Krishna, he is complete. Rasa, all the rasas are there with Lord Krishna. And Lord Balaram also enjoys relating to Krishna in the different rasas. That will, in, in another week or so, will be Balaram Purnima. And we can hear about Lord Balaram, how Lord Balaram 
relates to Krishna in all the different rasas. Lord Nishingadev was initiate, he was the first one to initiate more into the this rasa because of his relationship with Prahlad Maharaj and the affection which he showed for Prahlad. So Prahlad Maharaj is saying that you're saying I'm a great devotee because the Lord patted me on the head and because the Lord embraced me. But he said, that doesn't make me a great devotee. The Mayavadi, you know, those who are in the line of Shankaracharya, when they hear about these things, they say, oh, this is just sentimental. This is, has no real significance. This is just some emotional display. You know, the monists and the Buddhists, for example, there should be no emotion. There, should, there shouldn't be any emotion. There should be no ecstasy. We were trying, we were doing kirtan one time in a Buddhist country. I was in Taiwan. It's another Buddhist country. So we were having kirtan and there were quite a lot of Buddhists there. So some of the Buddhists came and they were, they sat there and they enjoyed the kirtan. They liked the kirtan. So we asked them, you know, come get up and dance. No, oh no, no, no. They, you know, they, they would sit and med they would sit and listen and absorb their mind in the kirtan. But they won't show, they can't show any emotion. They shouldn't make any kind of display. You shouldn't, they shouldn't dance. They shouldn't do anything like that. That is just sentimental. You know, they think this is just some display of the material world. And they are trying to detach from the world. So they do not understand the spiritual nature of our activities when we are chanting and dancing, they cannot understand that this is not material. This is not like karaoke or any other disco. This is purely spiritual rasa that we're in, engaging in the rasa for the pleasure of Krishna. Just like our cookbooks, Sometimes, you know, I remember we were doing a book fair and we were showing, we had vegetarian cookbook. So we were showing the vegetarian cookbook to some of the Buddhist monks. And the Buddhist was looking at it and saying, this all looks like sense gratification. All the dishes look so opulent and everything. So, you know, they didn't, they, they think, should be no sense gratification. I said, no, I said, this is for Krishna. We're cooking for Krishna. You have to understand, we're not cooking for our own self. We cook for Krishna. So we make nice dishes for Krishna. But their mood, there should be no sense gratification. There should be no taste. You know, cook everything, everything will be bland. Even the soap, the soap should not have any smell. If the soap has perfume or some, oh, Maya. <laughs> you know, this, this is a kind of renunciation. They think this is all sense gratification, mundane. And similarly here, Prahlad Maharaj being embraced by Lord Nishringadev, that, there, that some people will say, oh, this is just some emotion. And Prahlad Maharaj is even arguing like that. He's saying, you think I'm a great devotee because the Lord embraced me? No, not everybody agrees to that. They would say, this is just some emotion, just some sentimental display. Doesn't, doesn't mean he's a great devotee. So like this, uh, Preaching Krishna consciousness sometimes can be quite challenging because people have their own ideas about what is spiritual and what is material. You know, if you're chanting and dancing in ecstasy, they think just material, just sentimental. But if you're sitting, oh, very spiritual. If you're sitting very straight back, eyes closed, 
the very silent, oh, very advanced, very spiritual. They're thinking like that. Just like the picture with that, the, the money is on the table and the man's going, I won't touch the money. People thought, oh, he's a great devotee. He's very advanced, a great sadhu. He will not touch money. Prabhupada said, take a picture of me counting the money. And I said, he said, I can count it better than any bank teller. And I will spend it all for Krishna. And so there's, you have to understand what is renunciation, what is spiritual and what is material. Don't be carried away by sentimentality. Can you understand this point? Are there any questions? getting married and uh, having children. Some parents uh, do not get the children at all. They can't produce at all. In such a case, how they will clear the debt of their parents, Maharaj? Some parents do not what? Do not want, they don't get only. Huh? Oh, don't get child. Don't get only. Yeah. So? Not those parents, those uh, husband and wife, how they will clear the debt of their parents? How to clear the debt from the, for their parents? Well, they have to surrender to Krishna. If you've surrendered to Krishna, then you're freed from all debts and obligations. Mm. Yes, this is a verse of the scriptures, that one who is surrendered to Krishna, then is freed of all debts and obligations, because he's taken shelter of the Supreme Lord. So, that's what they have to do. Thank you, Maharaj. Mm. You don't have to worry, just surrender to Krishna. More people should be surrendering now because many couples nowadays they're not blessed with children so easily. Fertility rates are much lower than they used to be. So people should surrender. More people are meant they should come and surrender to Krishna. So surrender to Krishna doesn't mean you have to come and live in the temple, but at least you have to make yourself devotional, you have to, and you, they should sacrifice some of their hard-earned wealth for the service of Krishna. And you can take Krishna for your son also. Prabhupada tells a story about how one Brahmana couple, there was one Brahmana couple, uh, they, 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 they had no son, so the, how to, who will do the last rites? Because when they, when they leave the body, usually it's the son who has to do the last rites for the parents. So they have no child. So who will do the last rites? And so then the deity did it because they were worshiping the deity as their child. They took Krishna as their child and they worshiped the deity as their child. And so when they died, the deity came and performed the last rites for the couple. So that's also there. Yeah, of course, you can also, they can also adopt, they can adopt a child. And in this way, try. To give that child, you adopt a child, try to adopt the child, make the child into a devotee. It's difficult. I, some couple, there was one couple, they adopted the child and 
they put the child in the Gurukula. <laughs> but the child, you know, I mean, they were good, very good devotees, but the child who they adopted, some, he wasn't, you know, who didn't have the same samskars, you know, and they tried to make him a devotee and it, it was too much, you know, he just couldn't handle it to be in the Gurukul. Eventually, Gurukul didn't want him. They had to go into another school. So sometimes it's a problem like that. You adopt a child. Okay. Any other thing? Okay. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada. Jai. Krishna devotees, thank you for attending only. Now in the class, the next one, Krishna, we'll meet tomorrow.